Hey everyone, God bless you, and thank you for tuning in. I have a reflection that I have prepared for you today that I'm entitling Two Visions to Convert the World. Two Visions to Convert the World. Does that sound a little bit uh, radical? Hmm. Better have a sip of my coffee. You might notice the, this is version number two, version number two. Hmm. Well, converting the world is radical, and it is, in fact, the command that our Lord Jesus Christ gave to his apostles after his resurrection, just prior to his glorious ascension into the heavens to sit down at the right hand of his Father and to rule as King of Kings. Possessing all power and authority, he commissioned the church to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that he has commanded. It is, on the surface, a radical affirmation, and yet even the way that we hear it as 21st century Christians, most of whom live very far away from the Holy Land, who already have experienced the kind of unity of the world uh, through modern technology, it still sounds radical to us, but can you imagine what it sounded like to first century fishermen in the Holy Land? Certainly that they must have thought, Lord, how is this possible? <laughs> how is this possible? And on top of that, the sheer magnitude of the commission in comparison to the sense of resources that the apostles had, besides that impossibility in their heads, <laughs> there was the great religious question that we have these cultured, committed Jewish Christians who have had, through their religion, a deep uh, separating wall placed between them and the pagan world. And they're thinking we're supposed to leave that, we're supposed to be interacting with non-Jews, with pagans, and becoming the agency for bringing them into faith and to the church. Certainly, this is an absolutely radical reality that must have seemed impossible to the apostles. I'd like to speak with you uh, a little bit from the Acts of the Apostles, both from chapter 9 and chapter 10, because in each of those chapters, a vision is given, one to St. Peter, one to St. Paul, to overcome the awesomeness of this commission to make disciples of all the nations and to baptize all peoples. The Acts of the Apostles is the singular history in the New Testament. It's the only history. It is a unique genre in the New Testament, therefore, right? We have uh, the gospel and evangelical genre, four of the gospels. We have many letters, right? 21 letters. This is an epistolary genre. We have the apocalypse, which was a well-known apocalyptic genre. What's unique about the Revelation is it's a Christian apocalypse inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we have this unique history, the Acts of the Apostles. And this History is an outworking. St. Luke wrote the Acts for many reasons, many beautiful and inspired and edifying reasons, but one of those was to show the outworking of Jesus' commission to make disciples of all the nations. He documents how that happens. This is why he begins uh, Acts chapter 1 with the recitation of uh, Jesus asking them to be his, his, the disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And then Pentecost comes in the next chapter. It's documented in Acts chapter 2, providing the solution for the lack of resources of the early church to be able to accomplish the Great Commission. They now have the Holy Spirit, the greatest inspiration and power on earth to be able to accomplish this task. And St. Peter turns his attention in Acts chapter 9 and 10 to removing the obstacles in the lives of the foremost of the apostles, to remove the obstacles between Peter and Paul and the accomplishment of the Great Commission, and especially the idea of interacting with pagans and uh, becoming one in Christ with Greeks. This is uh, unheard of and not permitted according to Jewish law. Since Peter and Paul, the foremost of the apostles, are the keys to the leadership uh, in the Great Commission, these two who would become uh, the apostle to the Jews, 
as St. Paul describes St. Peter, and the apostle to the Gentiles, as St. Paul describes himself. These two would be the, uh, the supreme leaders in converting the world, both the Jewish and the pagan world. And they faced these major obstacles. Uh, Peter was a Jew bound by the rules of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Peter, when he receives uh, this incredible vision from God, uh, <clears throat> it's recorded in Acts chapter 10. He's up on the roof of a house and he's praying. And in the middle of his prayer, there's a sermon to give about prayer but not now, <laughs> from this account. Uh, in the middle of that prayer, he falls into a trance and he has a vision from God of a great white sheet, what's called the great sheet vision. And it descends and it's full of all sorts of four-legged animals and crawling creatures, all types of animals that Jews are forbidden to eat, according to the Mosaic law. And he hears a voice saying, rise, Peter, kill, eat. It happens three times. The sheet appears, settles on his roof. Little side note, it's time for lunch. <laughs> the text says that Peter was hungry and was thinking about what he was going to eat for lunch. And then God showed him what he's going to eat for lunch. What you really need to hunger for, Peter, are all of the pagans, all of the Greeks, all those that were forbidden you as a Jew to interact with, you couldn't speak with them, go into their houses, sit at a table with them. And God now says, rise, Peter, kill and eat these unclean animals. Peter's aghast. He says, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. And the Lord says, no longer call unclean what has been cleansed. That which God has cleansed, no longer consider unclean. And then what do you know? Peter Hilfen hears a knock on the door. He's at Simon the Tanner's house. His host comes and gets him from the roof, and he meets the delegates who had been sent to him by God of the pious Cornelius the Centurion, who was a pagan, who admired the people of God, who admired the Jews, imitated their prayers, tried to learn to pray like them, made alms, uh, loved God, who he was striving to know. And God sent an angel to Cornelius and told him through the angel that his alms had been accepted uh, and that he needed to go and get Peter, who had something very important to tell him. Peter then goes prepared by the great sheet vision. He no longer has the great fear of disobeying the Old Testament law, of keeping him separate, himself separate from the, the Greeks, from the pagans. He goes to Cornelius' house. He preaches the gospel. Cornelius and his whole family believes in Christ and the Holy Spirit falls upon them and Peter baptizes them and tells his Jewish Christian friends that it's clear that God has accepted the repentance of the Gentiles. He brings this news back to the people of God uh, in Jerusalem and there is an outrageous contentious debate. Uh, the, the believers for the most part, recognize that God has now accepted the Greeks and is asking them to come into uh, the Christian faith and that the old ways have to go. But a certain contingency of the Jewish believers are outrageously upset. How can these people be accepted, be baptized without accommodating the Jewish law? Don't they have to be circumcised? Don't they have to follow the dietary regulations? Don't they have to keep the details of Jewish worship practice that are commanded? The answer is no. The old has passed away, beholding Christ, new creation. They had a tremendous temptation, these Jewish believers, these Jewish Christians, with the newness of the new covenant and the passing of the old. Without that vision, Peter would have had no courage, no confidence to start receiving uh, Greeks into the faith, nor to support um, what was about to be an explosive missionary endeavor by St. Paul. So that's Acts chapter 10. That's Peter's vision, the first vision to convert the world that opened the door towards that. The second is St. Paul. St. Paul had a vision. This is actually described in the chapter before, 
But notice that Saint Paul, I mean, uh, Saint Luke puts these these two visions: Paul's vision in chapter nine, Peter's vision in chapter ten. He puts them right next to each other, just as the missionary work of the church is about to explode into the pagan world. These visions are the foundation stones upon which the evangelistic work of the church uh, explodes. Paul also had a problem. He, of course, was uh, bound by the same Jewish practices that would separate him uh, from interaction with the pagan world. He couldn't go into a pagan's house. He couldn't sit with the pagan at table. You're not supposed to mix like that. But Paul had a much greater problem than Peter. Paul had the great obstacle of his own unbelief he was not a Jewish Christian when he had this vision. He was an unbelieving Jew. He was a Jew who rejected the Messiah, who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And he had even become an outrageous persecutor of the church, standing there when Stephen, the proto-martyred archdeacon, was murdered and stoned to death. It was Paul who was giving his kind of official decree and assent to the murder of this believer. Paul then went to the high priest and asked for letters to arrest Christians wherever he found them. And he got on his horse and was on his road to Damascus. And there on the road to Damascus, where he was going to attack us, to attack Christians, there at noonday, when the sun was shining at its brightest, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to St. Paul in his uncreated glory, which made the bright physical sun look dark. And Paul heard these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard to kick against the goads. <laughs> That's an interesting text. It means, Paul, look, I, you, I'm calling you. I have your destiny. I am your destiny. And all your fussing, all your resistance, is just like an ox who has his... Uh, halter on him, and he's kicking, actually, the very mechanism that's that's guiding him, the yoke that's on him, and all he's doing is hurting his leg. He's making his work. It's futile. Resistance is futile. <laughs> this is what the Lord Christ said to St. Paul. Paul was blinded, fell off his horse, lost his vision, his physical vision, which is a symbol of how blind he was to the scriptures, to the Holy Spirit, to the fulfillment of the promises of the kingdom in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then he was baptized by Bishop Ananias of Damascus. And after he was baptized in the illumination of holy baptism, since Paul had found out who Christ was and had repented and believed in him, he was able to see. But this time he was able to see with spiritual eyes and no one in the history of church has seen what that man has seen. Not only in the miracles of his own life and the people becoming Christians, as the great missionary of the church, as he would become, but also his visions of paradise being taken to the third heaven three times, seeing things and hearing things that he could not relate. They were so outrageously beautiful. So Paul's double problem, the problem, the Jewish problem and his unbelief problem, were both solved by this incredible vision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as a little side note, that spot where Christ appeared to him, that spot has been consecrated in the Patriarchate of Antioch. It's, uh, there's a church there, a beautiful statue of Paul outside the church, um, and his horse. Marvelous. These visions convinced the foremost of the apostles, dear ones, that God was extremely earnest and sincere about the conversion of the world. These visions were what was necessary in order to bring about your conversion. It would take more to convince the entire church, however. These apostles were um, converted, yes. Uh, but many, a significant number of early Jewish Christians strenuously resisted, strenuously resisted. There was, according to Luke and Acts, great dissension and debate over this. We would call these uh, Christians Judaizing Christians who were not willing to accept the temporary passing shadow nature of the Old Testament and the Mosaic Law. Remember that uh, St. Paul would describe the Old Covenant as a covenant for children, as a schoolmaster taking children uh, to school 
And now that the children have grown up into the new covenant, that schoolmaster is no longer necessary. The telos, the end of the law, is Christ, St. Paul says. Uh, it's come to its fulfillment. Those Judaizing Christians uh, who did not accept that through baptism in Christ there is no longer Jew and Greek, that these kinds of ethnicities are, uh, and divisions are over, now, the great division of the world is between those who are baptized and those who are not, those who are in Christ and those who remain in the first Adam. St. Paul's practice was to start preaching everywhere he went in the synagogues. He would start there uh, with the people of God who had received the promises of the Messiah. It was right to go to them first. Of course, Jesus had modeled this in his teaching to the disciples, um, that they were to go to the loft sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and then later he sent them to the nations. That was St. Paul's practice uh, in the early decades, in the middle part of the first century. This is how he preached. And then once he had spent his time gathering Jewish converts, leading them to the fulfillment of their faith in Christianity and in, in Jesus Christ, then he would turn his attention uh, zealously to win all of the Greeks, all of the pagan world, and he traveled all over the place in the course of four incredible missionary journeys uh, to accomplish that task. By the later decades of the first century, uh, the Jews, having had their decades to have the special witness of the apostles given to them so that they could listen to their own prophets, believe their own prophets, accept Jesus as the Christ, and become Christians, the apostles' attitude changed, certainly. Um, this is reflected in St. John, the theologian the, of the Twelve Apostles, the apostle who lived the longest and died the last. In his apocalypse, uh, he no longer has that positive uh, disposition of going to the synagogues first. Uh, for decades, that had been the Christian practice, but now uh, the Jews had become resolved persecutors of Christians. You see that developing right through the Acts of the Apostles, and it was even worse uh, after that. And so when St. John speaks about the synagogues and the apocalypse, he does so with a very critical attitude. In fact, in the apocalypse, St. John calls the synagogues synagogues of Satan. They held on to their Jewish law and rejected the fulfillment of the law, what the law spoke about. Jesus Christ himself. The heresy pendulum would swing uh, as the first century continued. The, the pendulum would swing from Judaizing heresies, that is, Christians who were uh, insisting that converts become Jews in order to be Christians. It would swing from that wrong-headed idea of maintaining circumcision, dietary regulations, and the Mosaic law, and it would swing exactly the opposite way, so that by the end of the first century, uh, the most um, well-known and horrendous heretic was not a Judaizer, but in fact someone uh, just on the opposite spectrum. This is Marcion, who was the son of a priest who fell into heresy and not only rejected the Old Testament, so he was far from trying to keep it too much, he rejected the Old Testament completely and, and suggested that the God of the Old Testament was not the God of Jesus, that he was a creator uh, God of evil. And he also created a new canon, a canon of the New Testament in which references to the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the Old Testament were eradicated. He had his own canon. And Marcion was an extremely talented uh, and accomplished heretic and caused unbelievable trouble uh, to the church. Nevertheless, despite uh, heresies, the Heresies were definitively dealt with in the Jerusalem Council recorded in Acts chapter 15 and would continue to be dealt with by the church as they arose over time. Nevertheless, the conversion of the world proceeded apace. And these two great visions that God gave were the necessary foundation stones upon which uh, the explosive evangelistic work of the church would come to pass. Glory to God for his great mercy and for walking the church into a position in our early days when she could accept this gargantuan task. We thank the Lord for this. We glorify him for loving the world and seeking the thir thirstily seeking the hearts of all people throughout the whole globe. Glory be to his name.